We're going to have two scripture readings. Julie's going to help me out with one, and I'm going to do the one. First, Luke 5, 25. The birth of John the Baptist foretold. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priest division of Agi. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you do call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. But he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he is born, he will break back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in the years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had been seeing a vision in the temple, for he kept making sign to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and then for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. May the Lord add his blessings to this part, Julie. Luke 1, 57 to 80, the birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, When, then, is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hands of our enemies 
and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine in those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. We give thanks to God for his holy word. Thank you.
established by King David long ago. 24 priestly houses. And each of these divisions had a shift during the course of a given year to provide the priests who would staff the temple during worship. Zechariah belonged to the 8th division, the house of Abiah. Within each house, there were, there were, of course, far more priests than there were jobs to be done. So the rabbis tell us that, you know, it used to be a first-come, first-served sort of thing, and then they had issues of priests shoving each other off the ramps in a race to get to the jobs they wanted to do. And everyone agreed, this is not going to work. Priests are breaking their legs in the temple. That's not good. So... They instituted a system to lend order. There were four lots that would be cast, picking first one priest to clear ashes away from the altar. The second lot picked 13 priests to slaughter the sacrificial animal. The third lot picked one priest to offer <coughs> incense. The fourth lot picked one priest to actually offer the animal's limbs on the altar. Now, the system with this third law mandated that the incense offering had to be made by a priest who'd never served that way before. And Zechariah had never done it. <coughs> All the years of his life, he never got that chance. But now, in his old age, he finally does. Now, you think back decades, when, when Zechariah was a young priest in his 20s, maybe he daydreamed about finally getting inside the temple sanctuary his job. And he waited. His 30s came, and he waited. 40s waited. 50s and 60s, he waited. And here he is, maybe in his 70s, maybe his 80s, maybe even his 90s. And that's when his name finally comes up. This is his long-awaited call. This is why he's been a priest all these years. So the day is coming, and there he stands. Maybe he's trembling on, on his first day of service. It's morning. Time for the first of the two daily sacrifices. <coughs> the court of Israel, outside the sanctuary, is thronged with worshipers, eagerly watching, while 13 other priests slay the lamb divided into pieces. The punch and stench of death fills the air, stinging the nostrils of the crowd as a reminder of the costly nature of our sinful ways. The crowd is gathered and they're praying their hearts out. They need to communicate with God. It's about more than the blood. It's about more than the cost. They need a relationship they need to be heard and to hear. And that's why there's an incense offering. The aroma and the smoke rises to heaven while the sweetness of their prayers blots out the stench of death. And as the people watch and wait, the priest will, will then emerge from the sanctuary and will convey God's answer by blessing them with the priestly benediction. That's how it's done. That's how it works. And in the law, the incense offering carries a promise from God, I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God. That's what Zechariah has come to do. He's in the temple. He stands at the southern side of the incense altar, surveying its shining gold plating, staring down between the four horns on the smoldering coals pile of incense, specially formulated by one Jewish family for this purpose and no other, rests in his shaking, age nodded hands, cupped above the altar. Everything around him is peaceful and silent, the way it's meant to be. Zechariah moves to drop the incense on the altar, but he is an altar. Suddenly a man stands at his right hand, appearing out of thin air. 
The man stands at the east side of the altar, between Zechariah and the door. This man is facing the veil that marks off the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant stands hidden, and where God dwells upon the mercy seat. Now, needless to say, this stranger startles Zechariah. Nearly gives him a heart attack. Luke admits from the outset, this is no man. This is an angel of the Lord. We'll soon learn that he's Gabriel, one of the highest ranking angels in all of heaven. And he's come with a special purpose. Now if you're going about your business, you're concentrating and someone materializes out of thin air next to you, you might well scream. I can't imagine Zechariah acting any other way. He's, he's terrified. Maybe he, he's sputtering in disbelief. Gabriel tells him, don't, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Gabriel represents God's unexpected interruption of the normal course of the ritual. Why should that come as such a surprise to Zechariah? Maybe Zechariah was too much like us. Doing holy things in a holy place but never once expecting God to do anything. Least of all, expecting God to deviate from the script. Gabriel tells Zechariah, don't be afraid. Gabriel being there means that all this praying they've been doing has not gone unnoticed. The crowd outside, praying under their breath or chanting prayers loud, they have been heard. And that, that's the whole point of the ritual, isn't it? Before the incense column even hit the ceiling, God was listening. And then there's Zechariah's prayers from his youth, when he still hoped he'd have children someday. God heard those prayers. Decades flew by. Zechariah barely remembers those days on his knees as a newlywed, praying to God. Those prayers reach God just the same. And the prayers of all Jewish history, no, all human history, all this time we've been asking God to do something about the waywardness of the world. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and nothing seems to change. We, we wonder if God is tuning us out. Gabriel's here in the temple to let Zechariah know that God is not tuning us out. God has heard those prayers. Zechariah is going to have the son he'd asked for years ago. And that son is the assurance that no matter the weight, God hears his people's prayers. Now Zechariah hears this news and he finds it too good to be true. He's been tutor in the Bible. He's, he's familiar with the story of Abraham, asking dumb and doubtful questions. Zechariah should know that. But even so, Zechariah asks, what's going to happen to let me know that this is really going to take place? You know, as if a personal visit from an archangel were kind of a sign already. Now, I don't know the tone in Gabriel's voice when he answers. And I have, I have a suspicion, and I think I'm probably reading more irritation into the reply than was actually there. But when I read the story, it sounds in my head like this. Gabriel saying, excuse me? Excuse me? Hey, buddy, look at this name tag. Gabriel. I have a full-time job, and it involves being face-to-face -face with the majesty on high at all times in perfect communion and bliss. I got sent away from the glory of God's immediate presence to run this little errand to you. And this is how you act. Down me. Fine. Fine. I'm going back home. You want an extra sign? How about you close that cynical mouth of yours? There's a sign for you. I'm out of here. For some reason, uh, the Bible always sounds more sarcastic in my head. <laughs> That's how I would have delivered Gabriel's lines, at least. That's why I'm not an angel. <laughs> Just like that, Gabriel's gone. 
Now what's happening in the meantime? The crowds outside are watching the temple with bated breath. Maybe they can see the incense filtering out the windows. They know what's supposed to come next. This isn't their first tummy in service. They're waiting for Zechariah the priest to come out and bless them as a sign that God is hearing them. Zechariah is taking a long time. Did, did Zechariah slip and fall in there? Does Zechariah need medical attention? Did Zechariah forget what he's doing? Is God angry with us? That's what might be going through the heads of the crowd. Oh look! There's Zechariah now! He's coming out! The crowd waits expectantly for a blessing, but the priest can't talk. He's gesturing. Something obviously happened in there. He saw something. The crowd doesn't know what. What's going on? What's this supposed to mean? Zechariah's faithlessness stood in the way of them hearing the answer to their prayers. Zechariah has no blessing to give. The masses are going to have to hold their breath for a little while longer. Now, Zechariah finishes his work, morning and evening. I guess a substitute wasn't allowed, so there he is, the voiceless priest, going back into the temple day and night, probably looking apprehensively over his shoulder every time he does to see if Gabriel's hiding somewhere in the dark corners. He must be thinking the whole time about what Gabriel said to him. How could he not? Gabriel told him that just like Abraham, he's going to have a child in his old age. Not just any child. This child is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, even in utero. In a few months' time at the most, within Elizabeth's womb will rest a fetal prophet. An unborn person living in person-to-person -person relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Cuts against everything elite American culture wants you to believe about the unborn. And even as an unborn child, this child will be able to recognize God as an embryo in the womb of his mom's kinswoman Mary. More about that next Sunday. And in answer to this special grace, the child will be called to live a special lifestyle. The same lifestyle which Samuel had been called from his birth. No wine, no strong drink, no, particip no participation <coughs> in the usual course of daily pleasures. He's set apart for a special sort of holy self-denial, because this child's going to have a job to do. This child will be someone great. Maybe not as the world counts greatness, but more importantly, as God counts greatness. This child will grow up to prepare the people for the Lord who is coming. He'll rebuild Israel to the Lord's specifications. He'll restore them to what they once were, so that they're ready for the Lord to arrive on the public scene. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He's not great because of any attributes or characteristics he has in himself, he's great because he points. Even in medieval art, this child is usually shown pointing. He does what the whole Old Testament does, points to the Messiah who's coming. This child is great because he sums up the whole Old Testament in himself. You want to know what the Old Testament is all, all about? Just watch this kid and you'll see. He is a one-man Old Testament, which is why he's later called the greatest man of all who were ever born of woman. Zechariah doesn't know all that part, but he knows Gabriel's words have to be important. Zechariah packs his bags and goes home to Hebron after his week away. He sees his wife at the door. She expects to hear his voice call, but he can't. Can you imagine Elizabeth trying to make sense of her husband's sudden muteness? Somehow he manages to get across to her what happened. He's got the time. 
And the prophecy begins to come true. Elizabeth is pregnant soon enough. For five months, she stays inside the house, doesn't mingle with the other women in town. In the sixth month, she welcomes a visitor and gets clarity that God is doing something very big. And after Mary has been with her for three months, a son is born. All Elizabeth's neighbors know something incredible has happened. God is magnifying his mercy to Elizabeth, going out of his way to show special compassion to her in big ways. And there she is, cradling her newborn son, the son no one thought she'd ever have. The time's come for the next big step, the boy's circumcision. It's the deadline when the child needs to be publicly named as a distinct person, as a son of Israel. The neighbors are here, family, sisters, nephews, nieces, they all show up. They want to follow tradition. A man's firstborn son ought to carry his name. That's just how it's done. But at the very least, he needs a good family name. It's tradition. To follow tradition, you name the kid Zechariah. Now, there's nothing wrong with tradition. Tradition is important, but tradition does not trump transcendence. When God's doing a new thing, tradition is meant to bow its head and step aside. Elizabeth insists on the name that Zechariah had explained to her. That name was John. The name John means Yahweh is gracious. This name means that God's grace is intruding into a new way on the human stage. Interrupting the normal course of tradition, just like Gabriel interrupted Zechariah's ritual. The neighbors of the family don't know that. I imagine they were worried that Elizabeth is trying to take advantage of her husband's unfortunate condition. He can't talk. He can't overrule me. I can say what I want. That's what they think Elizabeth is doing. So they implore him to, to do something about it. They gesture to him. He might have been deaf as well as speechless. He mimes back his desire to write something down. They give him some slate. He writes, they expect to see a message like, stop her, please. Here's the pivotal moment. Will Zechariah side with Gabriel and Elizabeth? Or will he take a stand against them? Will Zechariah belatedly believe what the angel prophesied or not? Is Zechariah in his old age able to accept something new? He slowly flips his tablet around so that all gathered can see what he scrolled. His name is John. And in that instant, that very act of public Obedience to God's word through Gabriel. Zechariah's ears pop open, his tongue comes untied, his voice box comes unstuck. And I like to think that in the first second, every word he'd been trying to say for those months, starting with the priestly blessing, comes rushing out all at once. The prayers have been heard, the prayers are answered, an old dog has learned new tricks. And as soon as the way is cleared, Zechariah can't help but praise God in a way that terrifies everyone who married to the mundane, the neighbors and relatives addicted to the average. Now before this ordeal, Zechariah could talk. His words were priestly speech. But now on the other side of the crucible of silence, Zechariah sends from priestly speech to prophecy. He's intoxicated with God. Zechariah sings a song, prays a prayer, because the Holy Spirit that fills his newborn son, that recently filled his wife, now fills him as well. The whole family is awash with the indwelling God. Like baby, like proud papa, he's a prophet. And he's going to bless the Lord God of Israel for taking action. This child really is great. That's not just eternal prophet. He's the ultimate Old Testament prophet of the Most High. And this baby is a sign that salvation is near. The Lord is looking graciously on his people with redemption on his mind. 
the Messiah is on his way, the ancient prophets were right. That's why John would bring such joy and gladness, why many rejoice in his birth. You know, joy and gladness aren't words we often associate with the harsh and wild prophetic ministry of John the Baptist, living in the desert, eating locusts and honey. But his harshness yields joy because it mows down everything that disfigures. People are glad to see him because he cleans them, he restores them, he sets them free for something new to be built. He releases them from the baggage of their past so that they can welcome with open arms the greater grace to come. Real joy doesn't come from doing our own thing. It isn't found in an empty quest for self-fulfillment on terms of our choosing. Joy isn't in the glorification of pleasures. Real joy means turning to the wisdom of the righteous. Real joy comes from the message John will share and the Messiah John will announce. John's birth is a prophetic sign that the world stands poised on the cusp of the most magnified mercy. The untrammeled mercy of God is moving from promise to fulfillment before our very eyes. That's what John means. John is a sign the dim moonlight of the law is giving way to the blazing dawn of the incense altar promise. The promise that God would dwell among the Israelites. John means that God will dwell among the Israelites in Israelite skin soon enough. So that we can serve God fearlessly in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. The promises are about to come true. John is the down payment. John is Advent in human form. And then with our sins forgiven in the wake of the repentance that John's baptism will bring, we can walk in this new dawning light and find real salvation from the enemies of sin and death. We can walk to the new city of refuge. It is in Hebron. I imagine John's infant hand stretching out the gesture, pointing toward the horn of salvation from the house of David, about to poke through in the service of Bethlehem. Let's point with John. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for all the saints who ministered to you under the Old Covenant, leading up to and including John, the forerunner of our Lord. As we've walked with them these past weeks, as we've prepared our hearts for Christmas time, as it breaks in upon us, this new dawn of God's tender mercy, well, we are ready. Let us be ready. Let us be a people prepared for the Lord's coming. And let us point to Jesus, the babe of Bethlehem, the horn of salvation, the mercy of God in our flesh. Amen.